Outlast is a metaphorical flashback that directly correlates between the antiquated United States government's ideals of the 1960s and World War II Nazi scientific ingenuity. The creators, Red Barrels, have never once publicly stated whether or not Outlast is a critique of big business and how socialism contributed to the lavish lifestyle of several billion dollar corporations. However, given the immense evidence left behind by the creators, it's not a far-fetched idea to correlate the relevant evidence to the idea that's brewing in so many people's craniums. Where is the mythology in all of this scientific jargon? Well, the scientific pursuit by fictional scientists and Outlast is the means to justify bringing mythology to reality. Olympic gods and Western Jesus have no say in the world of Outlast mythology. The cerebral manifestation of an entity being stronger and more intelligent than the average human was the brainchild of one brilliant, yet fictional, Nazi scientist Rudolf Wernicke from the late 1930s. Before elaboration continues, the research paper must be clarified and specified to enhance the overall intentions of this research paper discussing myth. The strategic planning that's intended to be used in this research paper consists of a three-pronged approach. Since this essay is exclusively discussing a video game, the utilization of class textbooks will only be used to back up claims that are of a broad perimeter. That is to say that if an interpretation of a real-life myth is available to fit into the myth of Outlast, the source will be utilized to its fullest and necessary capacity. A playthrough of the game will have to be initiated to fully comprehend and embrace the lore and world building that Red Barrels incorporated into the story. After such playthrough has concluded, an extreme deep dive of the connected comic books will commence offering extra information that the game wasn't able to display originally. There is a hub of relevant information that directly comes from the website, outlast.fandom.com. Since this is a secondary source that only rephrases events, it will be used as a last resort. Just like with my use of Wikipedia, it's only to exploit concepts that will be compared and contrasted from first-hand sources. The first ever beholding of the entity commonly called the Wall Rider was on September 6, 1938 when Dr. Wernicke pioneered results while utilizing his creation, the Morphogenic Engine. The machine was a marvelous Nazi invention of unknown scope and capacity. Its sole purpose was to create super soldiers that could benefit the war against the United States and the Soviet Union along with other allies. The process of creating such capable beings of mass destruction would be as follows. An SS officer, a Schustoffel officer, would abduct an individual with severe mental trauma or an enemy of Nazi Germany and induce increased ungodly amounts of mental anguish until the individual would be rendered utterly insane. After this extensive torture concluded, the test subject would be medically rendered unconscious by the usage of different pharmaceuticals where they would be constantly switching between different lucid dream states. Once in this state of mind, the individual would be able to control a swarm of predisposed nanites which would form into a being that would closely resemble the person's physical form. In other words, the nanites would resemble the controller. After the brief manifestation on September 6, 1938, which was documented by Rick Schleter Lohner and Dr. Med Raj, Dr. Wernicke would attempt the same experiment, repeatedly failing but reportedly getting closer to promising results. However, before finally cracking the secret to creating Nazi super soldiers, the Third Reich would be beaten by the Allies of World War II, effectively destroying any chance of the further scientific pursuit of wall rider research. Frustrated and humiliated, but still hungry for the scientific research that would lead to the next step of human evolution, Rudolf Wernicke would allow himself to be indoctrinated into the United States four years after Nazi Germany collapsed, thanks to the highly secretive Operation Paperclip. The logistics of Dr. Wernicke's contributions to the United States are in deep fugue. Any information about his potential research has either been completely destroyed or lost to time. The microscopic amount of information that is available is the location where Dr. Wernicke was stationed, Los Alamos and later New Mexico. After his time with the United States government, Rudolf would, for the next few decades, retire and pursue hobbies such as landscape, photography, cat adoption, sanctuary, and isolationism. Cat adoption? <laughs> you got any hobbies? Yeah, cat adoption. <laughs> After years of tranquil living, Rudolf would be sought out for his scientific research by a self-proclaimed charitable organization known as the Murkoff Corporation at the turn of the millennia. Dr. Wernicke would relocate to Leadville, Colorado. The first order of business was to recreate the morphogenic engine and pursue super soldier research. There was only one problem. A facility needed to be built to house the massive machine, but that would raise some eyebrows in the public eye and in certain parts of the U.S. government. To circumvent this little debacle, the Murkoff Corporation would officially purchase an abandoned institution called Mount Massive Asylum, a once-used MK Ultra facility. With Mount Massive at his disposal, Dr. Wernicke would have an endless supply of mentally damaged individuals perfect for his inhuman research. In 2009, a boy by the name of William Billy Hope would be submitted to Mount Massive for experimental testing by his mother. This would be because of the large amount of money that was offered and to attempt to resolve William's clinical depression and disordered sleeping. It was unknown to Tiffany Hope, the mother, that the advertisement in the paper was more nefarious than it had legibly appeared. April 12, 2009, William Hope began consultations for the Morphogenic Engine Program, or the Wall Rider Project. William would obviously not be aware of the specific procedures he would go on to endure. 
Four years of testing ensued until September 10th, 2013, present day in the game, when retribution was finally obtained through bedlam and freedom fighting by the test subjects or experimental variants. However, one of these individuals sought out consensus through another means of action. Martin Arkhambod, an elder riddled with dementia, sought understanding from Project Wallrider by means of religious cultism. Mr. Arkhambod, prior to the asylum outbreak, was an ordinary patient at Mount Massive who would regularly participate in the arts program. This would simmer down his delusions of schizoaffective disorder. However, after the cancellation of the program by Helen Granite, these mental disorders would exacerbate his already declining brain functionality, guiding Mr. Arkhambod's belief in a higher calling to be at the forefront of his cerebral degradation. September 17, 2013 is when a legend, religion, and myth would be conceived by the mind of Martin Archambaud. Nearly every patient from Mount Massive Asylum would begin to indulge in the Wall Rider religion. Mr. Archambaud, now Father Martin, would be the messenger who would spread his divinity's gospel, naming the process the Gospel of Sand. An unknown amount of hours would be spent spreading this ideology among different patients. Only a few resisted the temptations of transcending their anguish received by Murkoff's human experimentation. Father Martin's belief can be condensed into a simple sentence. Soaring beyond pain and death to receive eternal life requires the sacrifice of one's life to forever parade with God, the Wall Rider. Unfortunately, this religion was just a fabrication created by a mentally ill man seeking understanding for his torture. But a fact that cannot be ignored is the underlying persistence of something supernatural or at very least unquantifiable by human means. On December 27, 1985, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, an interview would transpire with Dr. Wernicke as the subject of attention. When asked the question, do you believe your test subjects achieved something supernatural, Dr. Wernicke answered no. And when a similar question arose, he said nothing is supernatural. However, when asked, you said Project Wallrider was a gateway. A gateway to what? The response never came. Exit interview recorded December 27, 1985, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Clearance Sierra Alpha, subject Dr. Rudolf Wernicke, 14866. The films are real. Uh, there was no alteration to the footage at all, no trickery? None. In June of 1943, you recorded three instances of spontaneous bleeding. Uh, half a dozen test subjects began to develop brain tumors? Yes. The autopsies revealed that the tumors were pure lead. It killed them? Can you explain why the results could not be reproduced in the United States? I have my theories. My homeland in those years. It's impossible to understand the things we felt, what we believed. The overwhelming fear, ecstatic rage, and English words are insufficient. More than hope. The human mind in that environment is capable of extraordinary things. You're saying the experiment needed... The proximity to death. To overwhelming madness. Only a test subject who had witnessed enough horror was capable of activating the engine. Do you believe your test subjects achieved something supernatural? No. Do you think that they contacted something supernatural? Nothing is supernatural. Then what was it? You said Project Wallrider was a gateway. A gateway to what? This so-called gateway hasn't been elaborated upon. It's no secret that the Nazi party, specifically Adolf Hitler, had an obsession with mythological ideologies and artifacts, such as attempting to discover the Holy Grail. Dr. Wernicke was a scientist of incredible caliber, a man that didn't subscribe to the abstract concepts of religion. Was he deceived into researching mythology capable of being synthesized in modernity? More information needs to be procured before such a consensus can exist. Only a test subject who had witnessed enough horror was capable of activating the engine. September 18th, 2013 was the official day a man by the name of Miles Upshur would confidently decree that with his investigative snooping, the Murkoff Corporation would finally falter or even collapse. Whatever they thought they could get out of this place has to be big. Might finally be the story that breaks the bastards. After a lack of reception in regards to Miles' article, The Devil's Bargain, he craved something that could finally put him on the spot, as well as destroy one of the biggest suppliers of biometric security there is in the world, Murkoff. Filled with confidence and vigor, Miles approached Mount Massive Asylum. Given the absolute void of information about what happened in the asylum during Miles' entry, it has to be stated that all information was sourced from security cameras scattered about the asylum. To be concise, during the late evening of September 18th, Miles courageously pursued his lead from Wayland Park about the atrocities Murkoff had been accused of. Equipped with a camera and notepad, the investigative journalist entered the asylum through one of the windows embedded in the building. Inside the asylum, chaos was commencing, but this would go unseen for the early stages of the investigative breach. 
However, it only took a few minutes for Miles to stumble across the tip of the human experimentation iceberg. Throughout the rest of his journey, Miles would document hours upon hours of video footage that could have destroyed Murkoff, but unfortunately, he was gunned down by the MTD, Murkoff's tactical division. An unfortunate ending for the investigative journalist. Or was it? The terrors of the internal happenings of the asylum were by no means mild. In fact, the mental toll of having to navigate through the nightmarish facility was just enough to induce accessibility through the morphogenic engine, or to be broader, allowed Miles Upshur to become integrated with Billy Hope, the wall rider. Reports primarily composed of conjecture by Wayland Park confirmed Miles' metamorphosis. Murkoff and Rudolf Wernicke had a mission in mind during their occupation of Mount Massive Asylum, which was to create some tape over super soldiers. They succeeded. A corporation that experiments with mythological concepts derived from totalitarian ideals remain a terrifying prospect that shall continue to terrorize the world of Outlast. Heroes exist and they will always remain, but that doesn't mean they'll survive or make it back home. Miles Upshur is a perfect example of a hero who's destined to fail and die for the right cause. The corporate mindset of myth is a problem that will continue to haunt a vast majority of people, even if the mythology is fundamentally debunkable. A perfect example of this is North Korea's belief that Kim Jong-un is a god, an individual who is pure divinity. If a group of people proclaims they know or are part of some type of legend or myth, and their subjects blindly agree to their blatant terror diddle, then history will continue to repeat itself. 